So, I don't know if you guys know CSI, the crime drama television series. In one of my favorite episodes, from the very beginning, they know who the killer is. It's very clear, but they just cannot prove it. So what they do is they use their secret weapon, a database of fingerprints, to see if the guy is not involved in previous crimes. So they discreetly take a glass out of his favorite bar, collect his fingerprint, and enter them in a big computer. And as you can see, after a few minutes, voila, the guy is in fact involved in previous crime, and the fingerprints match the database. They cannot arrest and prosecute him. For the CSI fan among you, this may sound like normal business. You know, at the end of the day, they always arrest the killer, right? Well, actually, matching fingerprint is pretty hard. What would you even look at to match fingerprint, to compare one fingerprint to another? And worse, how would you prove that this fingerprint in the database really belongs to him? Well, the CSI team should thank this guy, Edmond Locard. In the 1930s, he showed in a book called Le Traité de Criminalistique, he computed the number of points needed to uniquely identify a fingerprint to find somebody in the database. He showed that 12 points is all you need to uniquely characterize fingerprints. 12 points is all what CSI's Russell need to find a killer. Since then, fingerprints have been used extensively to identify and find people. But today we're leaving behind way more traces than just fingerprints. We call the collection and the analysis of these traces big data. Let's take an example. I have my smartphone in my pocket, pretty much 24-7. And just carrying this phone around, I leave behind my mobility trace, all the places I've been to. So how does this look like? Well, let's take an example. So this is my trip back from MIT in Boston to here in Louvain-la-Neuve. I flew from Logan Airport to Paris, took a train to Brussels, and then a car to here in Louvain-la-Neuve. So what I just showed you is what all this fuzz around big data is about. Well, not my mobility trace per se, but the traces we are all leaving behind. Because, yes, I'm currently here in this auditorium, but I'm certainly not alone. So we're all leaving traces behind. But the reason people are suddenly so excited about this, why big data is so important, is because the evolution of technology made it basically free to collect and analyze these traces. We're living in an age in which the cost of throwing away the information is higher than keeping it. So you might be wondering where is this information coming from? Well, I already told you about mobile phones. But you guys are always are still leaving traces, private information behind when you swipe your rewards card or when you connect to a Wi-Fi. But when I look in a database of fingerprints, I only see dots moving around. I don't know which trace is yours, as for fingerprints. Now, let's see. Can we do like in the CSI episode? Can I find you in the database? Is the way you move as unique as your fingerprints. So, let's see. To characterize fingerprints, we needed points. How about mobility traces? Can we also characterize them? And what would these points be? Well, let's say that I want to find my friend Scott from Boston in a mobility database. What could I know about him that would help me find him in the database? 
Searching a bit, I found out that he took a picture yesterday morning in downtown Boston. So I know he was in this region of a kilometer square, approximately between 10 and 11 a.m. Well, that could be one point for mobility traces. If I search a bit more, I can also find out that he went to visit his girlfriend, Lisa, in Cambridge later on, sometime around 11.30. Well, how about this being a second point? And I can continue like this. I know that, for example, they also had lunch together later on in Somerville. That would be a third point. However, Boston is a pretty big city. Eight million people all moving around all the time. If mobility traces are unique enough, how many points do I need to find Scott in the database? So just as a reminder, Locker needed 12 of them to find somebody using his fingerprint. But this is the offline world. So let's see. I'll ask you to raise your hands. So how many of you think that we need 50 points? Raise your hands. We think that we need 50 points to find Scott in the mobility database. No? 25? 10? 5? 4? 3? 2? 1? Ah, two people. So. You know, sounds like most of you guys think, I don't know, something like 10 points. I mean, why don't we try? So we know that Scott was in downtown Boston in the morning. He took a picture there. But as you can see, there's lots of people in downtown Boston in the morning. What if now we add the fact that he went to visit Lisa in Cambridge at around 11.30? and that they had lunch later on together in Somerville. As you can see, the number of traces is decreasing really fast. And in fact, I only need a fourth point, the fact that Scott was in wild time in the evening to find him in the database. So this is just a video. But our research shows that within an entire country, four of these points these approximate place and times are enough to uniquely identify 95% of the people in a country. In a real data set of millions of people, everybody's unique enough that four points is all it takes. So by now you're probably wondering if there's something we can do to gain privacy. For example, can we make identification harder by decreasing the resolution of these traces, decreasing their precision? To evaluate this idea, let me make a parallel with pictures. So as you recognize, this is the organization team of the TEDx Luvan and Nerve. And this is Thierry, who you met this morning. When I show you a database of high-resolution pictures, it's pretty easy to find Thierry. But now, what if I make this, pic this picture less precise? If I decrease the resolution? Here, you can still distinguish Eduardo from Thierry. <laughs> but look, when I continue decreasing and decreasing, it gets harder and harder and harder, and very quickly, it becomes really hard to win the game of where's Thierry. So now the real question is, are mobility traces like pictures? When we decrease the resolution, does it become impossible to find Scott in the database? Are traces becoming indistinguishable from one another? Or is the way we move around unique enough that I can still find Scott even in a very low resolution data? So to answer this question, we did exactly what I showed you. We took all the traces in our database and we decreased their spatial and their temporal resolution. We look at what happens if I don't know precisely in which auditorium I am, only that I'm somewhere in the center of Louvain and Neuve. I also look at what happens when we decrease the temporal resolution of the data. When I don't know the precise time of this talk, 
only that I was here, you know, at some point in the morning. That's the temporal resolution. So now, don't worry. This is the only equation I have in the entire talk, I promise. Just bear with me for a second. So looking at millions of traces and all the possible resolution, we came up with this equation to evaluate privacy. This equation tells me that the chance of me finding you in the data depends on the spatial resolution of the data, the temporal resolution of the data, and the number of points I've been able to collect about you. And this equation is really where our answer is. Are mobility traces behaving like pictures? Can we just decrease the resolution? Well, what this equation shows you is that decreasing the spatial resolution makes it harder to find you in the database. Decreasing the temporal resolution makes it harder to find you in the database. However, what this exponent, this p, means is that a few more points is usually enough to destroy all the privacy we just gained by decreasing the resolution. What this means is that mobility traces are definitely not like pictures. Yes, it gets slightly harder. Yes, we need slightly more points. But at the end of the day, you can still find people. Our movement, our daily routine, is unique enough that it's really hard to hide in the crowd. So does this mean that we should stop using our mobile phones, our credit cards, Google or Facebook? Well, I don't think so. Because the thing is, this data has an amazing potential. This data allows scientists like me to study human and societies at scale. It allows us to look at the behavior of millions of people and answer questions that we only dreamed of a few years ago. This data allows us to look at how people are connected within, with one another, like on this picture of Facebook users. It allows us to study the propagation of infectious disease, like malaria. Understanding how people move around carrying the disease helps us fight it better. But this data also helps you. It allows you to find within millions of web pages the one that answers exactly your question. It allows you to find the perfect spot in a new city based on where you and your friends have been. It allows you to know where there's traffic right now to plan accordingly and save time. So, to conclude, I really don't think we should stop collecting or analyzing this data. There's just way too much to gain for all of us. While human nature fundamentally constrains our privacy, I hope the work I showed you to inform new regulation and help all of us as a society make the right choice for how to use this big but personal data. Thank you. <laughs>